India is a fascinating land. Whenever I travel here and visit a place that I've never visited before, I get a feeling of anticipation. The land is so diverse, every place having its own qualities that are often unique. This time I'm traveling from New Delhi to Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu to make the 50 mile trip up into the Blue Mountains of Nilgiri and the legendary town of Uti, or more precisely, Udagamandalam. At an elevation of over 7,000 feet, yet another place of solace from the heat of the plains. My anticipation is heightened as Nilgiri is the home of the famous Nilgiri Mountain Railway, part of a UNESCO heritage site. The other two parts, Kalka Shimla and Darjeeling, I've already filmed. As usual, Dr. Alex and his son Dr. Binu were my companions and we were met by my old friend Sashi of Magical Kerala fame. The smog of Delhi, a thing of the past. We were soon heading north and up. <laughs> the last time I saw Sashi was in Kerala. Tamil Nadu is a beautiful region tropical, colorful, and in the mountains the climate very pleasant. Even at this, the wettest time of the year, we manage sunny days. Quick stop for a South Indian snack. Some mutton and this kurma. Then on the road again. Some nice views. And then we began to climb into the clouds and passed numerous tea plantations. Finally reaching Kunua, the second largest hill station in Nilgiri after Uti and renowned for its black tea. We had another short stop off here, an important station of the railway where the maintenance sheds are located. Then on to Uti, the hill station established by the British in the early 19th century as the summer headquarters of the Madras government. We stayed in the Rattan Tata officer's holiday home, actually converted from the Tata family home that was exquisite. Some hill station hotels still have this old world charm. This one retained it to the extent that one can imagine it a hundred years ago. And to be able to enjoy three days here was a real treat. After a simple breakfast, we set out to explore Snooty Uti, the nickname given to this town, because in times past, it tended to attract the higher classes, both British and Indian. First stop was the railway station to get a ticket for the steam train. They celebrated the centenary of the railway here in 2008 and the place is still looking great. Tickets purchased, we decided to visit the sites and first made our way to the nearby Uti Lake. <laughs> the 
the lake covers an area of 65 acres and was formed by damming the mountain streams flowing down Uti Valley. We can row or take a motorboat. We decided on the motorboat, which was quite unlike anything I've seen before. The trip around the lake is fun. We have a chat, enjoy the scenery, well, the weather was a little dull. I'm a wildlife expert, so I need to tell you, this is a cormorant, and the trees are eucalyptus trees, I think. So what are the marks of a British hill station? It must be around 7,000 feet, have a lake nearby with a path around it, boats on it and fish in it, and preferably a boathouse where one can get a cup of tea. We then became dryland tourists and headed for the other thing every British hill station must have, a botanical garden, the British and their gardens. You notice they've never abbreviated it. The zoological gardens became the zoo, but for some reason the botanical gardens never became the bot. The 22-acre gardens were laid out in 1847 and are beautiful and well-maintained. In my experience of India and being British, I have to say that they are a very welcome addition to any place. They also mean we get to meet the local people, which is always an enriching experience. Next day a special treat, a visit to Mudu Malay National Park, now a tiger reserve, about 25 miles to the northwest in the Nilgiri Hills, the Blue Mountains. Here one can often spot herds of endangered Indian elephants. This is actually an elephant path. The park is a sanctuary for Bengal tigers, apparently 48 of them, as well as Indian leopards and other threatened species. We made our way to the reception center to hire a special vehicle to take us through the reserve and began an enjoyable safari, hoping to see the elusive tiger. Or should I say, trying to find one that was not elusive. The place itself is beautiful, but we kept our eyes peeled, hoping to see wildlife in situ, so to speak. First encounter, a wild boar no doubt foraging for truffles. 
Then a large stag that looked like he'd had an encounter with a tiger. Next a herd of cheetal or spotted deer. Seeing animals in the wild like this is a totally different experience to seeing them in a zoo. And though the tigers were hidden tigers, we nevertheless saw a great variety of fauna. The numbers of the Indian bison or gore are declining. They're the largest of all bovines and an adult can weigh over 2,000 pounds. Believe it or not, they can get aggressive. We even saw a peacock. Sad to say, no tigers. The wardens were friendly and helpful, and we had a nice chat with one of them. We then had a cup of tea by the river and a common langur decided to sit on top of our vehicle. Though we were not lucky enough to see elephants in the wild, the elephant camp gave us the opportunity to see these magnificent animals. The Indian elephant is one of three subspecies of the Asian elephant native to mainland Asia. Since 1986, Asian elephants have been listed as endangered. Unlike the problem of ivory poaching in Africa, it appears the main cause here is habitat loss and fragmentation. Recent estimates indicate the population has declined by at least 50% over the last three generations. We arrived at feed in time. How does one make an elephant walk? G up, a little slap on the leg, ask it nicely, or wait until it's ready. It appears we have to wait. When feeding time occurs, other animals, notably the wild boar and langurs, appear, trying to get a free meal. And succeeding. As it got dark, Salman, our friend, tried one last time to spot a tiger or Indian leopard. Dusk is a great time to see them, and he knew the places where it was most likely. He did his best, but alas, in vain. He emailed the following week to say he'd seen three tigers, so maybe we'll try again sometime. A meal in his home with his family was a real treat. His elder brother, Ebenezer, is our very good friend.
Next day, another pleasant breakfast and the chance to enjoy our hotel. One of Uti's most treasured claims to fame is that the first official set of rules for snooker were drafted here in 1882, when British billiards champion John Roberts visited India in 1885. He took snooker back to England. And as they say, the rest is history. We then set out in the beautiful sunshine to have another look at the town. I think now perhaps not as snooty as in times past. Hindu temples quite prominent. And I even saw the celebration of one of their festivals. did a little shopping and jumped in a motor rickshaw for a quick ride back to the railway station to catch our train. Unfortunately, not a steam train. We were soon enjoying the ride, as was most of the travellers. The journey took us through diverse and interesting countryside with five stops at the bright blue stations. During the 16 miles to Kunua, there are 16 tunnels and 250 bridges. It took 90 minutes, not exactly an express train, but considering the alternative a hundred years ago, it must have been a real step forward. Kunua Station, by the way, can be seen in the epic movie A Passage to India. It was an enjoyable ride, though a little cramped. The staff were very friendly and helpful, and I enjoyed a good chat with them. I sensed they took great pride in their jobs. The Kunua station is picturesque. The train then returned to Uti and here is actually being moved to the other track. We crossed the track and I filmed it departing. Before visiting the local shed, 
to see the engines. The oldest was commissioned on the 13th of April, 1920. It was fascinating to look around, a taste of history. Certainly the largest narrow gauge steam engines in India are here. Sorry, are you working here? Yeah, I'm working here. I'm Shankar. I'm working as a JE here. Oh. One last look at the station. And the coffee and the snack. And we were on our way back to Uti. On reaching Uti, we first had a look around and then made our way to a recommended restaurant, Earl's Secret, at the Kingscliff Hotel. Certainly one of the best, authentic 19th century with its wood paneling and open fire. We're in Old Secret. It's a British, old British house made into a hotel and restaurant. And uh, we're gonna have some nice food here next to a wood fire and really have a nice evening. The dining room was exquisite and it was a pleasure to eat there. The manager showed us the rooms, reminiscent of times gone by. and even rooms with four poster beds. I think we've stumbled across the old snooty part of Uti. Actually, we're very lucky to find this place but it has turned out, the place itself remarkable, the food very nice, and uh, not very expensive. The food, very good. We ordered a selection of Indian and Chinese food, and even a lamb in mint sauce. But this was our last supper. As we left the next morning, it was indeed with many memories.